Um, if uh, we get stragglers to show up, great. If not, we'll mail them the deck. I'm sure they're all looking forward to and uh, recording this video as well. Um, great. Well, cool. Let me uh, jump right in here. Um, we'll make some quick introductions. And then uh, we'd love to have Mike walk us through an overview of HubSpot Google OCI, uh, which stands for offline conversion import. Uh, I'll share some pro tips on what we've seen and uh, then we'll just kind of open it up to chat. So uh, Graham, if you have any questions or if you've done this before, maybe you have experience in this, like we'd love to get your thoughts on it or questions. Uh, obviously Mike from Google is here to answer any questions on the Google side of things. And uh, I can also answer anything on the marketing side of things as well. Um, and yeah, so let's uh, kick things off. Uh, Mike, I'll let you introduce yourself. Cool. Well, Jim, thanks for having me here today. So my name is Michael Dean. Um, I'm an agency development manager here at Google, and I've been on our agency team for actually in six days will be my five-year anniversary on, on our agency team. Um, I worked at agencies for about eight years before that. So I've been kind of all over the place with and working with and working for agencies. Um, and my job now is to make sure that partners like Extropy get the best that Google has to offer. So um, talking through a bit of OCI is something that I, uh, I now spend a lot of time doing and helping B2B and lead gen customers find success in Google ads. So I think this will be a, a fun conversation today. Awesome, thank you. Uh, and I'm Jim Hammerall. I'm the owner of Extropy. We're a Google Ads agency. Five days ago, we celebrated our 19th birthday. Um, and yeah, well, the only thing that we do is Google Ads. What we found over the last, I don't know, two years or so is that unless you have like this mechanism, this data feedback loop to allow to, us to feed data back into Google, like you're probably not going to be successful long-term. So this is high priority for us and for our clients. We've been doing a lot more of these integrations and uh, felt like we probably have a lot to share on the subject. So here we are today. Um, I will go ahead and kick things over to Mike. Uh, Mike's got some kind of um, I guess, level setting in terms of what OCI is, how it works, and uh, what the benefits are. So I'll let him walk through that, and uh, I'll take it up after that. Go for it, Mike. So, you know, the one really fun part of my job is I, you know, get to see hundreds and thousands of Google Ads accounts each year, um, which is always a, it's a lot of fun to see. It's fun to see how different businesses operate in Google Ads accounts. And the first question I usually get asked is, am I doing the right thing in this account? And just looking at accounts, sometimes it's hard to say like, yeah, like you're doing the right thing. It it really depends on what as a business you are trying to accomplish. Um, so, you know, getting back to the deeper questions of like, what do you care about as a business owner? Do you care about someone downloading your white paper or just a site visit? Or do you care more about a customer who submits a lead on your website and it turns into a $5 million deal six, six weeks later? Um, so the big thing that we're trying to differentiate here and why OCI becomes so valuable, or as Jim said earlier, is offline conversion import, um, is finding the good leads from the bad leads is usually clouded just by this lack of data. So, you know, Google ads, we have a lot of really great signals on the front end, but it's really what happens in the back end that we're generally missing out on. So, you know, again, we're just trying to find whatever you give us. So whenever we can change what that data looks like to drive better efficiencies and to find some of your highest value customers, um, that's really where OCI comes into place is how we find those better, those better customers over time. So here's kind of a fun place to start. And what I'll say too is, um, I like to joke that Google tools aren't always that smart. They really are is the reality, but they're also only as good as the data that we give them. So there was an eMarketer article this week too, and the main headline was something like, the so-called era of free money is over, which has driven investors to focus on retailers and restaurants' bottom lines rather than top-line growth and long-term bets. So what's really top of mind for a lot of businesses right now is how do we drive efficiency? And what that really looks like here is, what would it look like if your advertising didn't invest in people who weren't actually buying from your business in the long run or weren't particularly valuable for you? Um, 
And that's where we kind of moved to like this narrative. How do we get more efficient? How do we drive what's actually important to these businesses? So really focusing on driving business growth and efficiency has been a very common theme, especially in the past couple of months now. So what does that look like with Google? So again, you know, what if you could control your advertising to limit people, to only target people who are your highest value customers? Um, or even better yet, what if you could differentiate between your good customers and your best customers? I think that's a lot about what we're going to talk about today. And, you know, one part of this that I'll keep calling out is the number of signals we have access to. And this is what that starts to look like in practice. So there are something like, gosh, there are, I want to say it's a million new queries per day, or it's something like 15% of queries every single day we've never seen before, which is, it's great. And it's very like cool to see how consumer behavior changes over time, but people don't always search in the most helpful ways that we might think. So both of these queries look to be the exact same. It's both someone goes to Google and says, what's the best business intelligence software? And at face value, like, you know, the two people search the same thing. We probably should think those are very similar intent queries. But the reality is one of those queries might be from someone who is a, an intern at a new company or a new hire who's just looking to research what the marketplace looks like. But the other might be an executive who's ready to make a decision in the next few weeks and like needs to make a decision at that point in time. So what if we could bid differently for those people and treat those engagements entirely differently? So for the, the guy who's just looking to research, maybe we deprioritize that slightly, but we still stay in the market. And the person who is the executive, for example, like that's in market and ready to make a $5 million commitment to your business, let's really aggressively go after that person and bid more for that person. And when I mean bid, I just mean to say that we will value that interaction more. So again, for Google ads, that's usually cost per click, for example. So maybe for that new hire, we're willing to pay a dollar. And then for the you know the executive, for here, for example, maybe we'll pay $15 to get that person on our site. They're kind of arbitrary numbers there just to call that out, but just for the, uh, the sake of the example. So... Or I'll pause there for a second, Jim. Anything I've missed thus far that we should be chatting about? No, um, no, you totally covered it. There, I would say, in recent history, uh, it's been difficult to like differentiate what, who those visitors are that are high value versus low value, and so you kind of had to just bid everything the same. Um, and then I don't know, maybe five years ago or so, Google introduced. Um, automated bidding strategies where Google would automate or, you know, take into account a lot of the data on the back end and signals that it had to kind of help assist with that bidding. Um, and this is basically just an extension of that. OCI is like the next level from that. So, yeah. And especially with how the market is shaping them too, the, the better we're able to lean into these types of efficiencies and targeting more effectively is really what we're going to start to see a lot of customers really asking for more recently. So um, efficiency and measurement are always important, don't get me wrong, but I feel like there's a more heightened demand for that more recently. So um, I think now that we kind of got the, uh, the what here, I think let's talk about how we actually do these things. So how can you actually do this and improve your bottom line? Yeah. So Jim mentioned this earlier, what is offline conversion import? So offline conversion import is really taking some of your CRM data, and then in this case, HubSpot, and then allowing that lead to sale journey or any of the sales events that are captured in your CRM system. So is it a marketing qualified lead? Is it a sales qualified lead? Is it a closed deal? Um, and is there some value associated with that? So there's like the nine stages of the HubSpot uh, consumer lifecycle. Um, you are able to bring those into Google ads. So as simply as someone clicked on your ad, they submitted a lead on your website. When that's then stored in your HubSpot account or your HubSpot CRM, we can then bring that back to Google later on and say, this campaign, these keywords drove that long-term lead for you. So why is this so significant? Is that we generally see about a 20% lift in incremental uh, revenue and about a 30% improvement to cost efficiency. So it's a pretty marked change. And honestly, one of the first places I always start with every advertiser is like, what is your measurement basis? And for a lead gen or B2B customer, offline conversion import is kind of the holy grail of, of measurement we can get. So it's a very impactful place to start. So there's been a lot of, you know, why is this important in the market? What is the product that gets us there? 
but what does this actually start to look like in reality? And I've, I've started to explain this a bit here, but what this looks like more tangibly again is, say someone comes to your website, submits a lead. When they're submitting that lead, you're able to capture what's called a Google Click ID or a G-Click and tie that to your lead. So that when your HubSpot then is linked to Google Ads, what's happening mm -hmm. is alongside this lead form, you'll have a Google Click ID tied to each one of your customers. And that's what gets passed back in. So as your leads are flowing into HubSpot, that's when you can start saying, okay, here's my customer, here's a Google Click ID associated with that customer. And then let's start assigning values to what that customer journey looks like. So again, when I talked about your good versus your best customers, that's where we can start to differentiate that piece as well. So maybe you've got someone who submitted a lead but never followed up. That's probably a zero for value. Maybe you then have someone who has met with your sales team. And we'll start to think about like expected values here. So if you have a you know $10,000 lifetime value or a million dollar lifetime value, and they're you know 50% of the way through the funnel, maybe we'll put a value of 50% of that million dollar lifetime value. And then ultimately you have the final values in there. So once you have that value assigned in your HubSpot, you then pass all that back to Google. And again, that's through the offline conversion import process. Um, and then from there, this is where everything starts to take effect. So the measurement is only half the battle. Um, the other half really then is using automation like smart bidding to make sure that we find more and more of those customers. Um, so that's, that's really the big piece. And again, kind of that example we showed earlier of how do you bid differently based on who that person may be. So we have you know, tens of thousands of signals that can inform, you know, who this person may be, what they've done in the past. And, and that can be anything from where are they located? What kind of device are they on? What's the time of the day? Uh, maybe what are some of their, you know, browsing habits in the past that might inform this? Like if they just came from a search of, um, you know, I need to make a purchase today on a, a business intelligence software. And then they then search for your company name in that next search. You can probably assume there's a bit more value or intent behind that. So this is a bit of what that full funnel looks like. Um, Jim, I'll pause here for things. I know this is a lot. We get very technical very quickly here. Yeah. Anything clarifying here? The only thing that I would mention is uh, this diagram is interesting because it's a circle. And like I feel like the whole system is this flywheel effect where the more data you collect and then feed back, the better your results get. And the more and more data you collect and the more and more data you feed back and like it, the, the system seems to um, be self-propelled and it gets better and better over time with the more data that you can, that you can feed back. So um, otherwise, yeah, like you're, you're spot on. I think that um, when you are able to send that data back, that's a pretty winning equation. So. Yep. The one thing I'll call it here as well that I didn't mention that I won't go too deep into today, but the part that's very worthwhile to call it here, especially the value of this offline conversion import process and using a GCLID specifically, is this is a very privacy safe exchange. And what I mean there too is there is no PII coming into Google. Like there is nothing I can, I can't open up your Google ads account. I can't see what is the email address and the phone number of that lead you just created. It's all hashed data, but beyond that too, is you're just sending us a Google Click ID and a value assigned to it, and maybe what stage of the funnel they're in your house. So that's what makes this a very safe process as well, um, is that again, that it, it really does, in, a, in an era of heightened consumer demand of privacy, this really is a very strong way to help, again, align with consumer expectation of privacy, but also make sure you're getting the most out of your marketing dollars. So just wanted to very quickly call that out. Mike. Could you please uh, restate what you actually see? You say it's hashed and you only see what again? So it's the Google Click ID, which is again, it's a the long alphanumeric string is all that comes in there. But again, we don't even see that necessarily. It's all just lives hashed in the back end. And I think it's that, uh, gosh, SH264. I think Jim and I were talking about this yesterday, but uh, yeah. that just lives kind of on the back end. There's no place where that's then like stored in a place that like any, I have no access to it. Jim has access to it. So again, you're just sending us this alphanumeric string with a uh, what stage of the funnel they're in, and then what is the value associated with that. But there's no email address that's coming to Google as part of this HubSpot uh, conversion path. Yeah. It's a format called SHA-256. It's a 256-bit encryption, and it can't be reversed. I mean, 
maybe after a thousand years of supercomputer pecking at it, maybe. But um, yeah, like once it's encrypted, it's encrypted. And that's how we transfer that GCLID over to Google for identification and matching. So um, great. Um, Cool. So let's go deeper in what this means as well, then, in terms of how do we really activate against this. So the, the fun part here, kind of the thing that I'll keep calling out here, is there's three really big important components to all of this and how you set this up effectively. So again, the first one here is conversion values. I'll we'll talk about, about what this means here in a bit more detail as part of the sale journey. But the big part here is that as we can use conversion values to better differentiate who your customers are and conversion values, think of it just as a, what is the value we want to assign to any type of action? So an SQL, how much is that worth to you by way of expected value or a, an actual, the lifetime value of a customer. So the more data you're able to give us and the more you're able to say, here's how much I value these independent actions, the better our system can get. The next piece is that first party data. And again, that's effectively what HubSpot ends up being. It's again, is the more data that you're able to give back to us to really round out that whole consumer journey. That's again, what we really need to drive high quality leads at scale. And the last part, I just talked about this with smart bidding. There's other things about this as well, but smart bidding is the big component to this. Again, of, you know, I can get you leads all day long, every day. But how do we differentiate between the best leads, your good leads, and bad leads entirely? And again, smart bidding is really the best way to do that, where we can say, you know, these, you know, in the course of a day, find me a hundred of the best high quality leads, and then start devaluing some of those lower quality leads over time and eventually getting rid of them entirely. Well, I can't say entirely, but reducing them as best as possible. So these are really the three biggest checkpoints to getting this set up correctly. And we'll talk a bit more about, especially the conversion values piece. Ooh, uh, one thing that I would, uh, just comment on is in uh, under the conversion values, there's a link there that says use this calculator. Google very conveniently has put together this cool calculator tool where you can basically um, include lifetime value of a conversion, all the steps that it takes to get to that conversion and your internal conversion rates. And it'll basically spit you out. Here's the value of each of those stages you can um, leverage that data by using these static value imports or uh, to Mike's point, you can use like actual values. Uh, but that's a great tool, especially if you don't really know what what the value of each one of these stages is. It's, it's great because it puts it together for you. So yep. this is kind of what it looks like after you, you include those values. So I just want to segue into this slide. No, so it's a it's a perfect transition into this is this is what we call the lead to sale journey. And for again, for anyone who's working in lead gen, this might seem over overly simplistic, but this kind of sets the stage for what's to come and how we can set different values at different parts of the journey, depending on what data you have access to. So what we're really looking at here is what is the time to purchase between say a lead and actually becoming a customer? How many people are actually making it through that part of the funnel? And then what is the percent attrition through each stage of the funnel. So the more data we can operate with, the more effective we can become. So we work with some customers that will have as few as say one closed deal every two to three months. And that's really, really difficult to optimize towards because it's there's so few signals. So being able to look at all of the stages of the funnel, like in your HubSpot CRM, makes it incredibly impactful for being a more effective optimization machine. So I'll pass this to the next slide where I can kind of break down like what that means a little bit more tangibly as well. So this is all based on expected value. So if a customer say is worth $3,200 in this case, um, that's their calling up our value per deal. We'll talk about lifetime value in a bit here. But if there's a 25% conversion rate from sales qualified lead to a customer, we can then roughly say that, you know, whatever that $3,200 is, whatever 25% of that value is, which is about 800 bucks, um, that's what we can value a sales qualified lead at. Because again, if we get four of those sales qualified leads, we're likely to get $3,200 in value at that point. So you can keep moving down the funnel with this. And this is how you can then bid to independent parts of the funnel, depending on how much data you have access to, or depending on how long your sales journey is. Um, so some journeys may take a year, for example. So there's not a lot to operate with more quickly. 
So as we can start bringing some of those earlier stages of the funnel, it allows us to be a bit more quick to respond to who's actually converting or more likely to convert. So I know this is fairly complex, but again, that's a very big piece. And what the next part of this allows you to do is, again, importing that entire funnel. It not only helps you with like the automation piece, because again, there are parts that you may not want to bid to each one of those components. Maybe you just want the most, the lowest part of the funnel you can, or maybe bringing in every part of the, the funnel that you get can help inform what your channel mix actually looks like. And why this gets interesting is if you're running a video campaign, maybe a display campaign, you might notice that you get more of your lower funnel conversion. So more of a, say, a lead form fill or an MQL. But then your search campaigns are dropping more of the SQLs and actual customer deals actually being signed. So the more data that you're bringing in, the easier it is to inform what your campaigns are doing and how you should be splitting your budgets, how you change your bids accordingly. So again, the more data you bring in, the more impactful you can be for making smarter choices in what you're doing with your account. So again, this is kind of like the, the full funnel. And a part that I'll even take a step back here as well is what we've been talking about today is offline conversions. The more that we can bring in as many touch points as possible, the more we can have a comprehensive approach to measurement. So like full funnel measurement in this case, um, the more effective we can be at really nurturing and generating leads like through the entire purchase cycle. So again, everything from like the highest level funnel from just a page view, maybe it's a newsletter sign up all the way down to that closed deal, the more data you can give us, and again, this is all in a very privacy compliant manner, but the more data that you're giving back to this Google machine, the better we can get at finding more of your highest value customers. So this is a really good place to be. If you just tell me all I can get is one conversion stage from HubSpot imported to Google ads, and that's all I can do, and just say, you know, this is an SQL, you got about 20% chance they'll turn into a customer. That's already a, a good place to be. That puts you ahead of just someone who says, yeah, I got you 100 lead form fills last month. That first stage alone is incredibly impactful. The next place to this then too is, how do we start assigning maybe even margin values to those different leads themselves? So maybe you have you know an enterprise offering and say an SMB offering as part of your, your B2B offering or tech stack. If your enterprise offering has a substantially different margin, for example, than maybe your SMB offering has, the more data that you pass back to Google then and say, hey, this is more likely to be an enterprise lead. It's worth $10 million. This is an SMB lead. It's maybe worth $100,000. That difference can be brought back to us and again, can really help inform what you're targeting and why you're targeting. So that's the margin values rule. And that's that's that next tier up. And that, that's another level of sophistication. Lifetime value is kind of the holy grail. And that was on the previous slide, but um, this is where that then comes to life too, of what you can do with those different values. So again, the lower tier binary conversions are just lead form fills. Moving into say static values of anyone who's an MQL, just call them a flat $100,000. Then moving up to dynamic values, that's where we get into the margin range. And then the advanced dynamic values, where we really start to say, what do we predict that customer is going to be? So even if we just get an MQL coming in the door, or an SQL coming in the door, or a lead, we don't know if they're enterprise or SMB yet. If your team is able to qualify any bit of that, I know Jim will talk about some of these best practices here in a second. But again, the more we can qualify that earlier on, and the faster you can inform Google of what we think that customer is likely to turn into, the better off we are. Awesome, Mike. Um, I will walk you through some of the best practices that we've seen. But before I do that, I just want to reiterate that after uh, doing Google ads for 19 years now, what we found is that our job as uh, practitioners and campaign managers has radically changed over time. I mean, back in the day, it was bidding on keywords and adjusting levers here and there and split testing ad copy and things of that nature. Everything was very manual. Um, we didn't have a lot of the insights visible to us that Google has on the back end. Over time, things have transitioned over to like these automated bidding strategies where we're allowing Google's machine learning and everything else to like automate that and, and perform for us so that we don't have to pull as many levers manually as we used to anymore. Just in the last year and a half or maybe two years, things have gone uh, 
uh, almost vertical in terms of just a, a adoption trend here with this uh, notion of collecting data and feeding the correct data back to Google in order to inform those bidding decisions and campaign performance. And uh, OCI is uh, the iteration of that, what, whatever, whatever that is. It, OCI is what it is right now. I cannot imagine that two years from now, if you're not, if you do not have a mechanism to feed Google back, I'm sorry, feed correct data back into Google, that your campaigns are going to be successful. With the deprecation of third-party cookies and the way privacy stuff is going, if you can't close that data feedback loop, you are likely not going to be successful. I, I, I can't imagine that happening. People will get lucky and you'll generate leads and a lot of them will be spam. A lot of them won't be qualified, um, but you won't be successful unless you have a way to like feed that data back. So hence like the conversation that we're having today on how that, that feedback mechanism works. But uh, as it pertains to HubSpot, I kind of put together just a couple quick tips um, that we've seen uh, throughout the last few years that we've been doing this. Um, first off, implementing the HubSpot pixel is, um, I wouldn't say critical, but a very smart move. If you are using Google Analytics, um, whether it's GA4, Universal Analytics, you're able to collect and kind of curate these remarketing audiences, but adding a, a HubSpot pixel into those is kind of taking to the next step because then you can uh, start to identify actual revenue generating and like who's made it through your pipeline uh, and feed that data back to Google in terms of uh, lookalike audiences and custom audiences that you can create and uh, so on and so forth. So if you're not using HubSpot Pixel right now, I highly recommend that you do. And then build those audiences within HubSpot and then you can import those audiences back into Google Ads for ad targeting. Um, there are seven more or less, there's a couple of stragglers, there's like another option, but there's seven predefined sales stages within HubSpot. Highly recommend like you use as many of those as you possibly can, creating like these micro conversions to really help inform Google on um, how people are progressing through the sales stages and then assign increasing values to each one of those stages. So if a lead is worth say $100, you would want to say that your MQL is worth $150 and your SQL is worth $200. And so you have this like um, incrementality every time someone moves down the, the sales stage. That is what helps inform Google's algorithms in terms of like where the value is at post lead. Um, I'm kind of a marketing guy and I tend to stay in my swim lane, but I've been having more and more and more conversations with sales leadership as it goes on because sales leadership and their activities are crucial to us in terms of generating better performance on campaigns. Reason being is if a sales team is not updating sales stages within HubSpot in a timely basis, we're losing all of that data. And so a lot of times sales teams are incentivized by commissions. And so at the end of the month, when they need to go and turn in their reports, they're like, oh, update all this stuff in HubSpot at the end of the month that's probably not gonna cut it. They should be updating this stuff in real time or at the very least once a week. Maybe at the end of the week, they're going through and updating all the sales stages within HubSpot. But if you're not doing that, you have the, there's a high likelihood that you're gonna um, miss that look back window that Google has, which we'll talk about in a second. But you're also not getting that, um, that data fed back to Google in the time sensitive manner. And so having your sales team trained and know that updating sales stages in real time is super, super critical. Every time there's a sales stage that triggers that communication back to Google um, so that Google now knows, hey, this lead moved from an MQL to an SQL or from an SQL to a closed one. Uh, and, and that's really critical to get that in a timely fashion. The other thing I would say is uh, be patient. It kind of takes a while for this flywheel effect to, to take place. Um, but once it gets going, the quality of your leads goes up dramatically and the number of spam submissions that you receive just completely bottoms out. So um, you'll still see a couple stragglers, but we have one client that we're working with right now. They were getting dozens of spam submissions a day. It was tough to keep up with. We implemented this and it took four to six weeks or so, and now they get zero. I haven't seen a spam submission come through their CRM in 
weeks now. So um, it, it does work, but you kind of just have to be patient. Uh, don't get frustrated if you don't see results right away. It also, it takes a volume of leads and conversions uh, for Google's algorithm to really pick up on what's working and what's not. So if you work in an industry that has a high volume of leads or if your budget allows you to generate a high volume, Google's algorithms will learn quicker than it would if you are generating maybe a lead every other day or a lead a week. It's going to take a lot more time and effort for Google to learn from that. So uh, if you can, um, uh, which takes me to my next point, if you can generate lots of conversions and funnel that information back to Google, it's even better. So what we do with low volume campaigns is we'll create like user engagement um, conversions. So whether that's you know a white paper download or maybe you sent out an email and uh, that person received and read that email or uh, whether it was a phone call uh, touch point and you can record that within HubSpot and move that person down the sales stage. All of those little micro conversions will really lead to faster and faster learning from Google when you have like longer sales cycles. If you do have a long sales cycle, Google has a 90 day look back window. And so if you can't complete a lead to a closed one deal within three months, that's okay. Um, but you'll need to create these micro conversion steps along the way um, to keep informing Google that this deal is progressing. And again, that could be, hey, someone answered the telephone when we reached out to them and you can annotate that in HubSpot and move them to the next stage or whatever it may be, but you'll need to pack as many conversion steps as you can into that first 90 days because that's all that Google's got visibility into. So um, I will stop there. I know that was a lot. Um, and we picked up a couple of people on the, on the session as well. Does anybody have any immediate questions about any of that, or uh, does anyone we'll, we'll, we'll transition to kind of a fireside Q and A best practices? So, if anyone wants to share best practices or have any questions that we can answer, uh, happy to chat about that now. Graham had a few questions. I see in the chat. Are you able to see the oh, chat, Jim? I can. Uh, Graham, I will share a link with that um, calculator tool shortly, maybe after the the session here. I need to track down that URL, but it's in the slide deck and I'll, I'll email out that slide deck to you. So you have that. It, that's pretty cool. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and then would these be set up as imported leads within the conversion setup page in ads? Yes. When you, so um, HubSpot's great because it's got this native um, you know, Google ads connection tool, this API mm -hmm. natively built into HubSpot. When you connect HubSpot with Google Ads, um, HubSpot will automatically generate those imported leads for you. And so you'll go through and say, hey, this lead sales stage equals this conversion on Google Ads. And if that, if that conversion action in Google Ads is not already established, HubSpot will create it for you. You can then assign it a value using that calculated tool uh, I'll, link, I'll uh, send over to you or even um, actual values, dynamic values. And then you can move on to the next one. So here's what an MQL is. Here's what an SQL is. Here's what a, a customer is and so on and so forth. But yeah, everything's baked into HubSpot. You can create all of those conversion actions straight from HubSpot. It's pretty cool. You're doing it within HubSpot and not within Google itself? You can do it either or. Um, okay. If we don't already have those imported conversions set up within Google Ads, I'll just do it within HubSpot because you're killing two birds with one stone. You can set it up once and it deploys out to Google Ads versus creating it and then having to import it into HubSpot. Cool. I shouldn't say import. I guess it's more of like a mapping function. Yeah. Yeah. Great questions, though. Um. Any other topics? Uh, Graham, do you have experience with this? Are, are you using OCR right now? Or are you guys considering doing it? So we have a handful set up. We They were admittedly set up when we used an agency. I mean, I've, I've toyed around with it. I, it doesn't look overly. I was just in the, um, We I've set up one that like pulls from Salesforce. I've set up a couple that sync into uh, HubSpot. And so I was just, when I've gone to like update new fields or, or the new funnel, I would I guess I should say between HubSpot and, and the ads, 
Um, it yeah. goes to the Zapier. And so the only reason I was asking um, about like the interface where you're seeing it is just because uh, you mentioned like the native. And I know that there is like the the integration. Um, yeah. But my experience was setting up through Google, they, you know, it pulls up the Zapier thing and then you're going and finding it, um, which, yeah. you know, seems to work fine. But obviously it, my presumption is that the, the UI or, or even the experience in the HubSpot uh, is just a little bit easier to use. Yeah. What we found, because we've done it manually too, what I found is that the HubSpot integration allows HubSpot to collect those GCLIDs in the form automatically. Otherwise, you have to go in and manually update those forms with the hidden field that collects the GCLID and like add the script to collect it and, and all of that. HubSpot will do all of that automatically for you when you connect them together, which is great. That doesn't even happen in, in Salesforce. Salesforce, you manually have to go through and update all of your forms. So HubSpot's pretty cool. It does it for you. It's lightning quick and uh, pretty effective. The only thing I would say about HubSpot is HubSpot's got like this um, add-on tool, I suppose, for calendar scheduling. So if your business does a lot of like demos and booking demos or booking phone calls and, and you're using the HubSpot calendar tool, it will not collect GCLIDs within that calendar tool. You have to um, do a workaround through Google Tag Manager to allow you to collect GCLIDs through that calendaring tool. So there's a couple of extra steps there, but you can still get it to work. Cool, thank you, that's good to know. Yeah. Jim's a lot better versed in the uh, in that technical side of the uh, the deeper HubSpot side. I think where I generally run yeah. you know, the HubSpots, like the Google Ads side, I'm very familiar with the getting in the HubSpot side. I think that's where Jim's expertise can really pick up as well. Um, so yeah. I appreciate that. And I think, you know, to go back to one other call out here as well is the, that patience thing of like that, you know, giving it some time to really like build up the speed of the flywheel. Like I think it's a very fair call out. Um, getting higher quality leads is like one of the biggest questions we get from everyone of like, hey, getting spam leads, what do I do about it? There's things like reCAPTCHA that's helpful checking on your targeting, that's helpful. Um, but it's this kind of like being patient and really moving down the funnel with OCI. Like that's that's really one of the biggest things I, I kind of give people to, that it's always my number one recommendation recommendation for improving lead quality. So yeah. the patience is, is big. Yeah. Um, here's another pro tip I didn't put on the sheet, but um, one of the things that we were doing with uh, our customers as well, one of our customers was including this notion of this is a high value prospect for us. And after they've had the initial conversation with them and taken a look at their budget and things like that, they understand that this, this client, this prospect has the opportunity to be something really big for our organization, not above and beyond like an average prospect. And so uh, within HubSpot, there's a sales stage called Evangelist that we leverage we say, hey, anyone that we put into the evangelist bucket, these guys are like super high value. This is what we want to go after. This is like our target, you know, our ICP. This is, you know, our top 100 prospect list. When we add them to the evangelist, it then pumps that data back to Google. And we, add, you know, we give an arbitrary value of like $10,000 or something like that. Google then sees that. And uh, we're doing this with a client right, right now. We've had three uh, super, super high value prospects just this month uh, for a client of ours, and they're blown away uh, that now we're going beyond like informing Google who's moving their way down to a closed one status, but then informing them like, this is the ideal ideal, like these are the people that we want to go after, and that seems to be working. So uh, just a hack there if you want to incorporate that. Any other discussion points, Q and A, any, any questions? Anybody have best practices that maybe they wanna share? Great. Um, what we'll do is this is all recorded. I will go ahead and uh, send this out to you guys. I'll send you a link uh, to that calculated tool as well. So you can identify values by sales stage and uh, use that to help inform Google in terms of what's worth what. Um, otherwise, yeah, uh, if no one has any questions, I'll give you back some time today. And thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jim. Right. You bet. Bye, guys.